Hi, my name is Sammy Fodil. Thanks you all for being here. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, how uh, to build a decentralized cloud computing platform. So when you look at what happened before uh, with Web2, like the exceptional growth and innovation that happened, it was because of cloud computing. And cloud computing is also enabling actually uh, Web3, but with considerable uh, downside. So uh, we're enforcing, like uh, most D apps and protocols are using, you know, uh, hyperscalers, uh, hyperscalers cloud. So we're enforcing their oligo oligopoly, but also there is an inverse correlation between uh, the developer experience. So more abstraction developers are leveraging from these cloud providers, more vendor lock-in they have and more the centralized their solutions are. So uh, when you look at cloud computing itself, uh, it's actually neither centralized uh, nor decentralized. It's a model, right? So I'm quoting here uh, Paul Matris, a uh, former CEO of VMware. So he said, cloud is about how you do computing, not where you do computing. Then uh, when you look at like Computing capacity out there, there are like over a billion internet facing servers. Uh, major cloud providers only use uh, about 1% of all of that. So we have this huge capacity that can be tapped into to decentralize the web. It's just missing one thing. It's missing a decentralized cloud computing software or platform. That's the only thing we require. That's the mode that the hyperscalers have. That's the mode that cloud centralized cloud providers have. So what do we need to build a decentralized uh, cloud computing platform or actually uh, implement cloud in a decentralized way? So two main components, uh, I'll, I'll go over like more details there, but uh, we need a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, obvious, right? Um, and then we need to implement cloud features as peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols, right? So there is no central node that's responsible of a specific feature. So this is how uh, we uh, kind of like implement it. So a couple, uh, uh, I put it in, in, in kind of like a layer so it's easy to understand. So on the bottom layer, uh, we have the decentralization layer. So where we have the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network uh, and then uh, that's the P2P, the DAG and stuff from uh, IPFS. And then on top of that, we have uh, cloud features implemented as protocols. So CICD is a protocol, um, application registry is a protocol and so on. Uh, I'll go over some of these. Uh, and then on top of that, we have the execution orchestration layer. So we have the Tabite WebAssembly virtual machine that um, runs WebAssembly. Uh, we use that to uh, run two uh, features, D functions, which are just serverless uh, decentralized uh, uh, WebAssembly functions, and then smart ops, which are basically uh, D functions, but are executed for provisioning. So you can say like, don't provision this storage or this function or website unless this node is taking, let's say, a Filecoin, right? Or has a GPU or something like that. Uh, so on top of that, it's all cloud native. So GitOps and uh, serverless. So for example, if you want to change the state of uh, the network or there's something in your application, you have to push these changes uh, as YAML files to GitHub. It's not like an API, right? Uh, it, it's not like the best practice. So the best practice is GitOps and that's what, uh, like how we decided to go for it. And on top of that, we built tools. So web console, so grandma can build software. Um, uh, Tau, so CLI for developers to quickly uh, uh, spin up their projects. Uh, Dreamland and Audible, so it's, uh, I'll go over all of these, but uh, these are like tools so you can run a Taubite network uh, cloud on your laptop and test things locally. Uh, and Taucorder, so it's like, kind of like a tricorder, but for a Taubite network. Um, and then on the side, uh, these are not developer tools, but more like, uh, um, administrators or, or DevOps tools, uh, so Spore Drive, Odo and Q, so it's uh, deploying a network, um, uh, joining a network, um, Odo is a node that can run all the protocols uh, given a config, and Q is an observability uh, web tool. <clears throat> so 
Uh, I mentioned serverless, right? So, so you might think like, why, why aren't we executing like uh, containers or virtual machines or anything like that? So, uh, the thing with with serverless is it's like it's like content addressing, right? We can make it, we can easily make it like location independent, especially if the D functions are actually CIDs, right? And that enables a lot of magic and enables decentralization, but it also enables something very interesting. Uh, that I mean, I, I call autonomous, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to eliminate as much as DevOps as possible, too, right? That's the goal of, of serverless. Uh, why WebAssembly? So it's portable uh, and they're operable. It's secure, so we can control uh, like how much is accessible from there. It's easy to store as a CID. Uh, it has a cold start. Uh, if you guys know what cold start is in serverless, we have this thing called cold start. How long or how much it takes to get the runtime ready to uh, execute the functions. So with uh, uh, WebAssembly, it's very slow. We can also do predictive uh, uh, runtime uh, spin-ups, which will which can take it down to zero. Uh, and then there are possibilities to verify the builds and execution. Um, so let's take an example, right? So all def is is kind of like, uh, okay, is that bear? Okay, so all of that is kind of like theory and like diagrams and stuff. So let, let's look at, at kind of like an example. So this is a, a function, uh, same thing, go or rust. Uh, it does the same thing. So it gets a, a HTTP request and it replies with bunk, right? Very simple. Uh, what I want to demonstrate here is how this is, can this be handled in a decentralized cloud using different protocols instead of, you know, uh, how it will be handled in, you know, a, a centralized cloud, a Kubernetes cloud or whatnot. So, uh, okay, so the first the first thing that the client does is say, it will say like, hey, what is example.com? So let's say this function is on example.com and it needs to resolve that. So that's a DNS request, right? So instead of going to a uh, static DNS server, it goes to a node in the network that is listening to DNS and is also connected to the network. So we call that SEER, it, or we call it the SEER protocol. So SEER will say like, okay, uh, I have specific nodes in the network that I know have capacity and can handle this request. And you can see there, it's returning three IPs, right, to the client. So the client is, okay, I'm gonna take that IP one of the IPs uh, at a time. I mean, there is a failover round robin implemented in any browser. Uh, it's gonna hit one of these nodes and the node's gonna execute the function and uh, reply with punk, right? But really, under the hood, there is more happening. So let's look into that. Okay, so uh, the first thing that happens when that node gets the request is, what is example.com slash ping? Because it doesn't really know what it is. So it's gonna uh, reach out to a number of nodes that implement the Taubite name system uh, protocol, which is like a registry of applications, websites, and resources on the network. Uh, TNS is gonna reply with a definition of a function, which includes the WASA module CID. Uh, and then the node is gonna grab the CID from the network, uh, we don't have, like a Taubite network doesn't have uh, pinning because pinning like uh, um, relies on uh, like a cluster uh, and we want Taubite to scale horizontally and be edge native. So we implemented a protocol that we call Hoarder that can keep specific copies of whatever you tell it to. So you can keep specific copies of a CID or you can keep specific copies of a storage, a distributed storage, which is one of the resources that can be used on a Taubite cloud. So it grabs that CID, uh, TVM is gonna load the dependencies of the module. So it's gonna read the headers of the WASA module, load dependencies and dependencies of dependencies. Everything is in memory, there is execution and it returns the, um, uh, the response to the client. Basically, like what's uh, in this diagram. So hits example dot, like uh, resolves example.com, gets the IPs of available nodes, uh, send a request to a node, the node resolves it using TNS if it's not cached or doesn't know the answer, and then runs the code, returns the answer. 
and it's blazing fast. So you might think that's slow, but we actually uh, did a benchmark uh, compared it to AWS Lambda. So 10 times uh, faster cold start, and then eight times faster execution. So delivering that, like, you know, Web3 should be faster than Web2, right? So uh, let's look at some of these tools. So Web Console uh, is a tool that you can uh, use to build your project. So it's not like, like I said, like it's like it's it's Git operated. So actually, Web Console is going to ask you to log into your GitHub. It's going to uh, clone your repos in the browser. You're going to work on your repos on the browser and then push to the to uh, your repos. Once you push, there is a protocol uh, called Patrick. They'll grab that job and distribute that job to another protocol that we call Monkey, that, and they're gonna bid and race on who gets the build job. They're gonna build like whatever you send there, like could be config, front-end, WebAssembly, and deploy that to the network. Uh, we also have a CLI. Uh, uh, if I have time, I'll go through all of this live. Uh, so you can log in, create a project. It's uh, very easy to use. Um, and you have prom it has prompts, but if you're going to play it like badass, you can also use like options in the command and kind of like feed the command whatever you want. Uh, you can also edit YAML files. I mean, YAMLs are meant also to be edited by humans, but uh, it's up to you. I mean, command line makes it easy. Uh, Dreamland, so it's a local uh, uh, Tabak network. So uh, uh, you run it like uh, here I run like Dream New Multiverse. Uh, you can create multiple universes, like my universe is, the default one is called Black Hole, but you can create multiple ones, and then with Audible, which is the uh, uh, graphical web interface, uh, you can interact with the network, add nodes, delete nodes, inject fixtures, uh, and stuff like that. Um, we have more tools, so like I said, Sport Drive, deploy your own network, talk order, like you can play, you know, Scotty, uh, and inspect the network, uh, NNQ, which is an observability tool, so uh, it tells you like what nodes are in the network, which which ones are online, how much capacity, and stuff like that. Uh, okay, so yesterday uh, when we went to dinner, we I met some people from the IPFS Gateway team, and we talked about DevOps and stuff like that. And I had this idea: it was like, why don't I create a serverless IPFS Gateway, right? So it took me roughly 15 minutes, uh, uh, and the code looks like this. It's roughly like 40 lines of code, and um, I mean, it can grab a CID. So actually, uh, let me see where that is. Okay, here you go. So I grabbed the CID from uh, the, uh, the P2P documentation, uh, and, you know, basically it's, it's grabbing the CID and returning it. Right, and it's it's all uh, it's all serverless. So this function can run on any location uh, that the sandbox uh, network is available in. If so, if I go here, I don't know if you guys can see this, but we have nodes. Uh, okay, internet is slightly slow here. Uh, let me refresh quickly. Okay, so so these are these are the nodes that we have running around. So that that like serverless function is scaling horizontally through all these locations, uh, and it's only forty one lines of code, lines of code. Uh, you can also do more than that. Like you can do processing and and way more than that. Um, I'll show you here. I'm, I'm sorry, like the the screen resolution is is very small. So <laughs> like this is like image processing. Right, so this is all serverless and WebAssembly. So it's actually grabbing the image from HTTP uh, and then doing some processing on it, returning the result. Um, uh, and and like the code is also online. Like this is like what like seventy lines of code. Uh, we 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 can do Rust too. It's just Go is my preferred language. So most of my examples are in Go. Um, um, I mean uh, another example here is uh, Sport.2. Uh, so Sport.2 is a URL shortener. I actually have a video on YouTube how to build it. I mean, uh, 
I mean, I explained details and the video is like roughly 40 minutes long. So it's pretty fast front end and back end and basically stores whatever URL you give it in a distributed key value store. Uh, everything is distributed, um, uh, even the front end. So front end is a CID, all the functions are CIDs and the network builds everything for you. So the user, like the developer experience is amazing. Um, um, C3 is a chat or a, a Web3 chat that we've built. Same thing, like everything is uh, like on a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's fully serverless. Uh, and then everything we have is, is running there, like you know our website, blog, like uh, everything. Uh, so if I go to our blog here, and I'll show you this one, uh, the avatar generator, which is like a, an example I built that for some reason people like. Uh, so this is generated with a D function, right? Uh, and this is roughly 60 lines of code in Go, love Go. Uh, we support Rust too. And this is randomly generated, right? So none of this is our images, they're actually computed. All right, let me go back to my presentation here. Okay, so uh, we have two SDKs that are fully developed. So Go SDK, my preferred one, and then Rust SDK, which is also awesome. Um, documentation on Taohao, uh, two examples that I showed on, on the top, and then the little example I built uh, last night um, uh, to do like IPFS uh, gateway. Um, so what kind of features we support? So our, um, like TVM has a pretty, a pretty rich uh, set of features. I mean, you can look at all of that if you look at the, uh, the uh, Taubite SDK crate or uh, the uh, uh, Go uh, package. So uh, we, you can do HTTP, DNS, IPFS, uh, Ethereum. Like you can talk to a VM as well. Um, you can do pub sub storage, KV, like any resource that uh, Taubite provides you can communicate with that uh, from WebAssembly. Uh, we're wrapping up CIRCOM. Uh, so um, we're, we're uh, like, uh, you can call like the WebAssembly witness uh, generator from a D function. Um, and then you can also verify and uh, generate proofs from a D function as well. Uh, we're also working on serverless containers, which will enable things like AI and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. Do I have do I have more time? Okay, all right. So um, I'm gonna just uh, show off here uh, a little bit of uh, um, uh, like Tau. So uh, Tau is is the CLI that we have, and it's very simple to use. So if I do like Tau login, it's gonna log me in. That uh, here I'm logged in already. Um, it's really gonna log me in in, in my GitHub. Uh, like a Taubite network doesn't really require login. Like there is no real like API there to do a login um, because the source of truth is Git, right? It's Git operated. Um, so I'm gonna just choose that and then do like a Tau select project. And uh, this will list all my projects. And I'm gonna go for the IPFS gateway. And then I'm gonna do like tau clone project. You can you can do it with 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 Git, but we kind of like made it uh, easy to uh, to do all of that. So uh, this will clone uh, like uh, my project. Now if I uh, ls here, I have like IPFS gateway, and then you can see that I have config, which is actually like YAML files, right? So for example, my function that I was running is this get YAML. And let me do a let me do a cat on it. So it's very simple YAML, right? So it, it has an ID, uh, description, and then trigger. It was HTTP, right? We support P2P uh, and PubSub right now, and we'll add more. Um, and then the path is get uh, domains. So there is a generated domain that I tested with first. Uh, so you, like the network can give you a generated domain. Uh, and then I added my own domain, and that's a very easy uh, thing. You just do, you know, a TXT entry that the network gives you. Like it will give you like a um, like a token to add to your DNS for validation, and it takes like two three minutes to do. 
um, and then uh, execution, so timeout 10 seconds, memory 10 megabyte, and the function that we call is get, right? So that's what the WebAssembly module exports. Uh, for the code side, uh, I can go to code, and then you can see, I mean, this is like, like the reason there are two repos, so uh, the code repo has all the source of truth of the config of your project. Code repo is meant for inline coding, right? The reason we separated it because like somebody who's changing the config might not be the same that's writing code, right? Uh, but also, uh, you can also create other repos as libraries, right? Uh, the reason we did this code repo is for inline. So, can I, grandma can code, right? Or you can code on, on the flow, you know, like, like, like the, the IPFS gateway. I didn't have to um, do complicated things. It was just a few clicks and I was done. Um, and then, so this is my get function and, I mean, uh, I use the template, this is why it's called ping pong, <laughs> but, uh, but if I um, cut it here, hold on, uh, ping pong, that's the code, right? So roughly 60 lines of code uh, in Go, and that's, uh, you know, uh, planet scale or interplanetary scale uh, IPFS gateway in like 60 lines of code. Uh, yeah, um, any questions? I'll, I'll use the rest of the time for questions. Hi, Ed. so clearly you've got quite like deep integration in with IPFS and the, the, the general kind of stack, so you're able to you know, do a lot of IPFS things. Uh, you mentioned about FEM as well, and you could uh, you know, execute stuff on, on FEM. Yeah. Uh, is there a way you could have a tau function like register to listen to an event being emitted by a smart contract on FEM, because that'd uh, be a really cool function, the feature, so that a smart contract yeah. in FEM could call out to a tau function to do some other stuff and then come back. Yeah, so uh, we, we don't have that yet, but I mean, we can add it. That would be, be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's figure, like, sit together and yeah, get yeah. that done. That'd be cool. Yeah, Thanks. that'd be awesome. What other projects do you have on your roadmap? Uh, yeah, so uh, what's, what's uh, next? So we're, we're wrapping up like uh, uh, the CIRCOM support. So you can do like CIRCOM ZK proofs easily. Uh, and then uh, the next thing is gonna be like uh, uh, what we call serverless containers. So uh, we're, we're thinking like um, embedding the containers with the WebAssembly module. So uh, basically you can do things like uh, Python or AI and stuff like that from uh, WebAssembly. And it, like the whole package will be kind of like uh, packaged as a CID, uh, and I also like that approach because like I, I was at Wasmio, and the guys at Red Hat came up with this idea of putting a WebAssembly module inside a container. I think it should be the other way around. The container should go inside the WebAssembly module because WebAssembly is way cooler. Right? Yeah. Makes sense, right? So. Yeah. Uh, so another question, you mentioned uh, ZK proofs with the CERCOM. What use cases will it unlock? Yeah, um, so uh, some of the uh, use cases there, uh, so we're, 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 uh, there are a few Web3 companies that want to do, uh, uh, like need to do like ZK proofs and avoid kind of like using oracles because they're expensive. Um, I mean, having a Web3 cloud, you basically don't need oracles. You can build your own oracles, and ZK Proof is one way to do that. So, yeah. If I were to port an application to this that has existing databases and email servers that it calls out to, um, what is the security around uh, having keys to those servers uh, used in this system? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately I don't have a slide for that, but uh, we have a mechanism uh, where uh, the keys uh, are like n n no node in the network really has access to the keys. Uh, they are um, like when, when you want to store a secret, um, you reach out to a number of nodes in the network and ask for available, uh, kind of like latest available um, uh, generated uh, public keys. Uh, so what the network does in a regular manner, they generate public keys and then shards goes to nodes running a vault, the vault protocol, 
right? So none of the vault protocols can decrypt anything encrypted uh, with the public key by themselves. They need like a threshold, right? So you say like, okay, give me, give me like what's available. You figure out the one that's the best uh, that's shared between like, let's say three vault nodes because you don't trust just one, right? And then uh, you encrypt your, your secret with, uh, with that public key and uh, you send it to one of the vault nodes is stored in the database which is replicated but none of them has full access to it right so you need like a, a, a threshold of nodes to come together and agree to the like um, well actually you need a threshold of nodes to give you their partial decryption and then you regroup everything to get your key so that's that's how we do it okay but the running machine still has temporary access to the, yeah. Uh, the private keys. Yes. So if you if you want to avoid that, so we're we're working. Uh, it's not like an immediate kind of like uh, urgency because nobody is asking for that Im Im uh, urgently. But we know that there is like something called ego, uh, which runs like go in an enclave, uh, and that's kind of like one of the things that uh, we are thinking about adding. So when you gather that secret, like still nobody has access to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What's the cost or the revenue model? I mean, uh, you're probably looking for more nodes in, in your network. Do you have an incentive layer for nodes to join? And as a user uh, to, to run code or uh, do you have, is it a subscription model or you pay per execution? Yeah, so um, Taobite is not a service provider. So we're kind of like building the uh, Kubernetes for Web3. Uh, to some extent, so uh, the network where everything is running, all the, my examples, uh, is what we call a sandbox uh, network. So uh, people can build on it, but I mean, it's free, but we don't also guarantee capacity or anything like that. Um, but we're working with uh, specific uh, providers that are looking to uh, spin up their own networks. Um, and anybody can spin up their own networks super easy with Sport Drive, like you can spin up a network in, in a few minutes. and. Uh, um, we we uh, gather counters on what's going on on the network, like running of the functions and everything, and uh, we generate proofs for that, and then it's up to the provider to ingest that. So they can ingest it in a smart contract if they wish, or they can ingest it in a billing system. That's really up to them. Okay, thank you so much, Sammy. It was a great presentation. Cool, thank you.